Welcome to uh, a new episode of Ron Paul Flicks. I'm here today with uh, Libertarian Party presidential candidate Gary Johnson. Gary, thank you for joining us. Israel, great to be with you. Great to be with you. Here. I really wanted this interview mm. because Ron Paul, people like myself, definitely have some questions about supporting Gary Johnson. Sure, sure. And with Ron Paul now all but conceding the race, everybody is turning their eyes to you. What would you say about what Ron Paul has been able to accomplish over the last five years? And how do you now see yourself playing a role in what he's been able to do? Well, uh, clearly, I think he's been the number one spokesperson for what I would label the fastest, largest growing segment of American politics today, the whole liberty movement. Um, and so um, I'm a Ron Paul fan, and uh, I, can't, I can't thank him enough for furthering um, an agenda that I think really does fix America. Now, that said, what, what do I do for this? Well, um, Ron Paul has always said that he's been a spokesperson for, uh, for this movement. Um, I have declared myself as nothing, none other, that I am just a spokesperson for these issues. And um, I, I think that when his campaign comes to an end, and by his own admission, uh, he's not going to be the nominee, um, that um, this voice goes away. Well, it, well, it doesn't go away. Um, I'm going to continue to talk about these issues. And uh, they are very important. They identify what the problems are, uh, the solutions that go along with it, and Israel, um, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have a resume that I think suggests that I could do a really good job at this job. There is nothing in my resume to suggest that I'm not going to doggedly pursue the agenda that I'm talking about. Excellent. So in what ways do you feel you might contrast some of Ron Paul's policies and the major things he's been talking about over the last five years? You know, I don't know if I contrast with Ron Paul at all. Uh, Ron Paul is a social conservative. I'm not a social conservative, but Ron Paul would be the first one to say, look, uh, government shouldn't be legislating these issues. Uh, these issues should be left to individuals. Um, I would maintain the same. So I don't know if we actually differ uh, with regard to anything, really. What about on foreign policy? Do you think there's any difference there at all? I know from some of the things you've said, you've talked about humanitarian missions, uh, perhaps going after the conies of the world, where Ron Paul would be staunchly opposed to that. Tell us a little bit about your foreign policy and what it is and if it differs at all with, with Ron Paul. Well, f first of all, non-intervention, period. Uh, I'm not going to involve the U.S. military in any sort of uh, foreign conflicts. Now, foreign conflict is not getting attacked. Uh, getting attacked is a whole other story in that we should have a strong national defense. I think when it comes to the Coney incident, uh, if I were to uh, be able to, to uh, restate that or, or come up I think it's a great uh, issue for mark and reprisal. Okay. Uh, I I issue uh, uh, being able to uh, hire out, if you will, uh, that, that issue. Now that was congressionally approved and the uh, president signed off on it. Um, I just, uh, I want to be careful well, about... If I may interrupt, that yeah. was pirates attacking us though and, and our vessels traveling back and forth between here and the UK and France where we had the, the letters of marquee and reprisal. How would that involve Coney when that... Well, we could, could have issued, we could have issued the same letters for uh, Coney, uh, as opposed to involving the U.S. military. Now, uh, if, I would have, if I would have signed off on that, uh, uh, on our intervention, and I believe I would have, I would have asked for volunteers uh, to do that. Uh, I am, I am, uh, I don't know if volunteers were used or not. But I don't think any of us want to sit by and watch a Holocaust go down. Now, getting involved in, uh, in Libya, uh, we oust, uh, we oust um, uh, <laughs> Muammar Gaddafi and uh, his, um, his support army then goes off to Mali and topples the democracy of Mali. So we're down, we're down one democracy for our intervention in Libya and uh, who's going to take over? Well, another authoritative, uh, authoritarian dictatorship is going to take over. And what's going to be the difference? Right. Mubarak right now in Egypt. Um, the, the military is taking over, basically saying um, that, the, that the revolution, if you will, never took place. 
And so um, all of our interventions, uh, none of them seem to come to any sort of fruition. And now it is we're turning our sights on Syria. Uh, we're going to pick a winner. Well, the winner that we pick is just going to be another uh, authoritarian dictatorship. So we trade one for another. The unintended consequences that go along with it uh, give us no difference in, uh, in outcomes. The Coney, uh, trying, to, trying to draw a distinction, by my understanding, uh, this perhaps has been the worst uh, terrorist, terrorist organization on the planet for the last couple of decades. Arguably responsible for tens, this is my understanding, uh, responsible for tens of thousands of murders, rapes, uh, mutilations, roaming three African countries, all of which asked us to intervene. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, our intervention could have been dealt with through letters of mark and reprisal as opposed to the U.S. military. Right. So obviously we're both on the same page. If we get attacked by somebody, if Iran attacks us, then we will vehemently oppose them and attack them back. So and I'm the I, nation. Now, now Ron Paul would have the same position uh, that I do, but I, right now, being one of three candidates on the ballot in all 50 states, Obama, Romney, and myself, I'm going to be the only candidate that does not want to bomb Iran. Don't bomb Iran. We bomb Iran, we're in for a two-year bombing maintenance program of Iran, and how many, uh, are we, are, going to, are we going to make another hundred million enemies to this country that we would not have otherwise had by doing that? I think we would. So let's stop. And under what circumstances would you take the country to war against Iran if they had not attacked us? For example, let's say Iran attacks Israel. Do we then go to war against Iran to defend Israel? Well, f first of all, um, if, if uh, if uh, Iran goes to war with Israel, Israel is first and foremost capable of dealing with that, and Iran would be crazy to attack uh, Israel. If I were President of the United States right now, I would urge Israel to not uh, be to urge Israel to not consider bombing uh, Iran. I think that that would have terrible consequence. And so uh, attack is really the getting attacked and congressional approval for uh, military action uh, taken. And I think that that really is one of the primary responsibilities of the President of the United States is determining uh, what the threats are, uh, not offense, but uh, defense. Mm -hmm. What would you do about the troops that are currently stationed around the world? Japan, Germany, all over the place. Before. So so one of the promises that I'm making uh, if elected president is I'm promising to submit a balanced budget to Congress in the year 2013. Uh, that would be a 43% reduction in military spending. Uh, how does a 40, what does a 43% reduction in military spending look like? Well, it's, it's our military footprint on the planet. It's all these, all the bases that we have. It's the troops that we have stationed in, in Europe, in South Korea, in Japan, <laughs> in Great Britain. So just bring them all home? Uh, well, not by bring them all home, looking at this 43% reduction. So seven components to a 43% reduction, but a 43% reduction on our footprint. I can't sit here and tell you how that reduction takes place other than I will uh, produce that, this document. So the footprint reduced by 43 uh, percent. Complete uh, disengagement from all the military conflicts that we are involved in right now. Uh, out of Afghanistan tomorrow. Um, out of Iraq uh, tomorrow. Um, the military that are in uniform. Uh, the military, uh, the, the civilian support staff that goes along with those in uniform, a reduction in nuclear warheads from 2,300 to 500, uh, research and development spent on the military, intelligence uh, spent on the military, those being the seven components of, uh, of, of this reduction in military spending. Believing that the biggest threat to our national security is the fact that we're printing money borrowing money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar that we spend. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that that's sustainable. And going back, or cutting 43% from our military uh, takes us back to the year 2003, uh, after 9-11. Right. We'll get to the Federal Reserve in just a minute, but going on with foreign policy, what about foreign aid to all these countries? We're sending so much money to Israel and to Israel's enemies. 
uh, Ron Paul would, would stop all of that? I would stop all of uh, foreign aid. Uh, in a, uh, I would stop all of foreign aid. So foreign aid would be one of those uh, zero items. Mm -hmm. What about uh, countries like Haiti in the, in the instance of an earthquake where they're in dire needs? Do you think? Well, I, I think there's a I think there's a difference there. I, I really do. I mean, I think that uh, I think we all really uh, do have this sense that if we can help. Uh, in, in uh, catastrophic situations that perhaps we could, but not a matter of policy, but as a matter of benevolence and uh, as a uh, uh, being able to do that from the standpoint of, of not spending more money than what we take in. We can't borrow money to help other countries. We can't do that. That's not sustainable. So the biggest problem we have right now, Gary, is, is the economy. That's the number one Absolutely. threat. Absolutely, yes, yes. Um, and Ron Paul supporters, are uh, very, very concerned about the Federal Reserve. They want the Federal Reserve shut down. Obviously, Ron Paul has written a book called In the Fed. Um, and now he's, he has a bill that's about to go to the House and be voted on, the Audit the Fed bill. Tell us your position on the Federal Reserve. Should it be shut down? Do you support the Audit the Fed bill? Well, first of all, I would, I would end the Federal Reserve, but Congress would have to give me that piece of legislation. If they gave me that piece of legislation, I would sign on to ending the Federal Reserve. Uh, but the real key here is to stop printing money. Mm -hmm. And just pointing out the obvious, uh, if the Federal Reserve were abolished tomorrow, we would still be printing money. Uh, Treasury would still print money, just like they printed money before there was a central bank, just like other countries that don't have a central bank print money. Now, the whole issue of uh, Federal Reserve and that it's an inside job and that there is knowledge about uh, monetary policy that uh, exists on Wall Street to a degree that Basically, Wall Street knows exactly where monetary policy is going, where it's been, where it's headed, and we don't. Um, the Federal Reserve should be audited. Uh, there should be transparency to what the Federal Reserve uh, does. The Federal Reserve, this is if the Federal Reserve stays, which I have a sense that it, that it does. Federal Reserve gets abolished. Um, the, the functions of the Federal Reserve that I think are probably important uh, would and could be picked up by regional banks. So uh, Federal Reserve could be abolished. Uh, again, it's, it is something that I would sign on to. But most importantly, we need to slash uh, federal spending, something that really has never happened before. And getting the Federal Reserve back to its original mandate, which was price stability, as a, which I think denotes strong U.S. dollar policies as opposed to the dual mandate of, of uh, price stability and full employment, which I think full employment uh, denotes uh, weak U.S. dollar policies. Okay. So here it is. We have zero interest rates, and we have zero interest rates, in my opinion, because we are facing a monetary collapse, and that that's, uh, that's the eventual outcome to uh, of all our uh, monetary policies is that collapse of the U.S. dollar. Okay. So would you say you subscribe to the Austrian school? You're a completely laissez-faire economist. It doesn't sound exactly like it there, keeping the Federal Reserve around. Or we're, well, we're, we're yes, yes, yes. Well, well, the, the, well the, the whole notion of free market, and I did get to serve two terms as governor of New Mexico. I, I uh, may have vetoed more legislation than the other 49 governors in the country combined, and a lot of that legislation was uh, what I label crony capitalism. So um, you, you, you uh, talk about uh, government trying to manipulate the economy. I, I really understand this firsthand, and uh, I'd like to think that maybe I took a stand against uh, government and government trying to intervene in what should be free markets, perhaps more than uh, than anybody that served politically. Now, <laughs> I come away with that experience thinking I could have done a whole lot more. <laughs> it's kind of like reloading, if you will, that uh, as President of the United States, uh, here's all the things that I'm not going to do, not the things I'm going to do. When, when, uh, when uh, uh, people talk, they talk about how are you going to cooperate to get things done. Well, getting things done in Washington is code word for how are we going to spend money. That's what it's about, and so I don't want to spend money. I don't. I don't. I, I want to be the libertarian uh, president that challenges uh, Democrats from the left, from civil liberties, abolishing the uh, uh, or repealing the Patriot Act, uh, abolishing homeland security, don't bomb, don't not bombing Iran, marriage equality, ending the drug wars. I'd like to challenge Democrats to do those kinds of things from the left, and I'd like to challenge Republicans from the right. You know, actually, uh, actually, 
balance the federal budget and do it. Get some starch. Good. One small issue, it's, it's not significant to a great deal of people, but some are very passionate about it. Tenth Amendment powers within the states. Uh, Omaha, North Dakota, and even here in Colorado, uh, we, we were the first state to pass legislation legalizing gold and silver as legal tender many, many years ago, about 12, 13 years ago. As president, if a state proactively enabled a new currency based on gold and silver or any other commodity to back their own state currency, would you as the president oppose that or would you? No, I, I, I would not oppose that and, and understand that um, that's how we um, evolve uh, or get back to a commodity-based currency is to have competing currencies and I, I support that whole notion. Sure. Very complex though, as, as, yes, as I think everyone is aware. Uh, if you're going to tie, and I, I think it would be a good thing, but if you tie the dollar to, uh, to a commodity that is market-based, and you got a couple things going. You, you could actually have a ticker on the, uh, on the gas pump uh, relative to what gold was trading at at that moment. But we get through those issues uh, with uh, competing currencies and let the marketplace uh, determine uh, how this could actually be accomplished. Mm -hmm. You mentioned gay marriage before, and obviously Obama is trying to buy votes right now, talking about the whole gay marriage thing, which is something he hasn't done anything about in his entire term so far. Um, Ron Paul um, personally doesn't believe in, in gay marriage, but as um, a representative knows it's not his job to legislate the, the morality from the Congress either. What's your position on gay marriage? Would you let it happen? <laughs> Um, or would, there's a lot of people in the Ron Paul movement that simply want the government out of the marriage bed altogether, have no control over marriage, and, and let individuals just have their own contracts, which is the pure libertarian perspective. Where as president would you well, I, I, get well, involved there? Well, I, I think that this is a federal issue. I think this is, a, this is a, believing in states' rights, but this is a, a constitutionally guaranteed right, um, marriage equality, along, in my opinion, along the same lines as civil rights in the 60s. Uh, if the federal government wouldn't have uh, viewed um, uh, race uh, as a constitutionally guaranteed meaning that everyone is equal, would we still have segregated bathrooms in the South today if left to the states? So um, I support marriage equality. Um, the, notion of, um, the notion of getting the government out of the marriage business, there are, to my understanding, thousands of lines of federal law that contain the word marriage. Mm -hmm. Well. If you, if you get government out of the marriage business and into the civil union business, leaving marriage to the churches, what you end up having to do is literally change through legislation, not just one piece of legislation, but th a thousand pieces of legislation to change the language from wherever the word marriage appears to have to to have to change that. So effectively by taking the position of getting, uh, I take the position government shouldn't be involved in marriage equality, what you're essentially saying is, is nothing's going to change. Mm -hmm. Much like Obama's newly stated position, which is leave this issue to the states, well 41 states have said that marriage is between a man and a woman, so effectively he's, nothing is going to change. And I base the change on it being constitutionally guaranteed and federal government having a role uh, to, uh, to uh, President of the United States. I have, I have a role to govern under strict adherence to the U.S. Constitution. What about couples that don't want to have the state involved in their relationship at all? I'm from Boulder. Boulder County has some very unique laws that only a few other counties in the whole country do where any couple um, and I'm not sure about homosexual couples, about same-sex couples, but any heterosexual couple can simply declare to anybody that they are married and the county agrees that they are married. No paperwork, no marriage license, no marriage certificate, no nothing at all. Um, and a lot of people in Boulder County like that, that they can simply declare themselves married, the state has no involvement whatsoever. Do you think that should be allowed? Well, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just, I wonder about issues like uh, survivorship and, uh, and how that uh, ends up playing uh, as opposed to being a married couple. That is the reason for getting married is, uh, or certainly one of the reasons for getting married is dotting the I's and crossing the T's with sure. regard to uh, estate and what happens, survivorship and mm -hmm. uh, issues like that. 
Let's talk about a favorite topic of yours, which is the drug war. I think we're all pretty much on the same page there, but for those of you who don't know your position on the drug war, why don't you take a few moments to explain that? Well, uh, I think that we, sh um, uh, since 1999, I have advocated the legalizing marijuana, control it, regulate it, uh, tax it. 50% of Americans now uh, are saying they want to legalize marijuana. Well, the number's never been that high. It's a number that's not going down, it's going up. Why is it going up? Well, people are talking about it. And the more people talk about it, the better the issue does. I think it's very corollary to the prohibition of alcohol. Uh, I think that 90% of the drug problem is prohibition related, uh, not use related. That is not to discount the problems with use and abuse, but that ought to be the focus. Mm -hmm. So I really see, uh, I, I think it's significant that I'm in Colorado, I really think that uh, Colorado is going to, uh, certainly has the opportunity with the referendum to uh, regulate marijuana like alcohol, right. uh, that Colorado has the opportunity really to change drug policy worldwide. And it starts here, and Colorado is the first domino of 50 dominoes, and uh, um, I think it stands a really good chance of passing, and when it passes, uh, I see all the other states falling into line. I see Colorado passing this initiative and I see the entire country, uh, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Seattle, Des Moines, Iowa, everybody's going to be getting on a plane to fly to Denver to chill out for the weekend. Well, that's not going to last all that long. Uh, everybody's going to catch on, recognize that this is exactly corollary to the prohibition of alcohol. We tried that and it didn't work and it'll never be legal to smoke pot, become impaired, and get behind the wheel of a car or do harm to others, but that should be government focus, not whether or not, not what you or I decide what we're gonna put in our bodies. Okay, so let's alleviate some of the concerns of the Christian right, because even in the Ron Paul ranks, I, I would guess 50 to maybe even 60% of Ron Paul supporters are Christian conservatives. And the, the answer that they would come back with is, well, more people are going to smoke drugs, our society is going to degrade. Now, I know there are some countries that have gone this path and the absolute reverse has happened, but speak to that issue because people really want to know, what's going to happen if we legalize drugs? Well, um, so here, I, I think the biggest concern, I think that the biggest criticism of legalizing marijuana, uh, decriminalizing drugs, is that more kids are gonna are gonna do drugs? Well, um, based on the statistics of other countries, uh, Holland, which has effectively decriminalized all drug use, and Portugal, which has decriminalized all drug use, uh, the reality is is that both these countries have about 60 percent the drug use as that of the United States. That's on a per capita basis, but that's kids, that's adults, that's marijuana, that's hard drugs. So it really kind of flies in the face of what you think would happen. But what I would tell any parent who's concerned about their kids using drugs is, great, be concerned. And don't you love your kids and aren't your kids great? Meaning, don't you love your kids and aren't they terrific? So, statistically speaking, half of the kids that graduate from high school every single year have done illegal drugs. Do you want your kids subject to the criminal justice system because of choices that they are going to make? And so the message I want to send, the message that I sent to my kids was, look, here's drugs, here's marijuana, here's alcohol. I love you both. That's what I want to tell you. If you find yourself in a situation where you become impaired, which I would be crazy to not, uh, to not believe that it's, that it's going to happen, you call me first. I'll come pick you up, no questions asked, because I love you, first and foremost. So we love our kids, and we're subjecting our kids to the criminal justice system. We're, 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 we're arresting 1.8 million people a year in this country. And I suggest to you that, um, we don't have 1.8 million criminals in this country. We have, we have 1.8 million people that are making choices to use drugs even though they're criminal. Right. Um, and that it is anything but a criminal activity. It may not be to your liking, to, your, uh, to, to what you would consider good choices. Well, that's something that you should be, make known. Uh, that's something that by living by example that you could change other people's lives. But if you're going to make this government policy, we're, you're going to end up with 
2.3 million people behind bars, which is what we have in this country, which is the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world. China has, what, five times the population, four times the population, and uh, uh, 1.5 million people behind bars. Mm -hmm. So just one last question on the drug issue. What about heroin? What about crack cocaine? Should these be legalized as well? Well, uh, what, what we need to understand, now I'm not, I'm not suggesting that they should be legalized. I think, that we le I think we legalize marijuana and then we take, as a nation, we take giant steps toward rational drug policy for the other drugs. Mm -hmm. And the giant step is looking at drugs as a health issue rather than a criminal justice issue. Understanding that in Zurich, Switzerland, where they have a heroin maintenance program where you can get free heroin, that they have reduced death, disease, crime, and corruption, that Zurich is a better place to live today as a result of this program. And this is, by the way, coming from the chief of police from Zurich, who was very opposed to heroin maintenance in Zurich before it took effect, but has become a, a spokesperson worldwide for the positive impact that it, it has had because it, it did the opposite of what he thought that it would do. So understanding that crack cocaine is, uh, is a prohibition phenomenon. Crack cocaine is making cocaine cheaper, higher. It's, it's back to prohibition. It's back to the prohibition of alcohol. We were a beer drinking country before the prohibition of alcohol where we became a hard liquor country because, because given the bang for the buck, you could get higher, quicker, for less money uh, drinking hard liquor as opposed to uh, beer. Um, methamphetamine. Methamphetamine. I went and I visited um, uh, uh, district court judges in Portland, Oregon when I was governor of New Mexico. I didn't know how this meeting was going to go. They asked for the meeting. I got into the meeting and what they said was, we support you and everything that you're saying. We would like to tell our story to you that maybe you can relay this to others that others might understand it. They said, look, um, methamphetamine is really the terrible drug out there. It alters behavior, um, it makes people do crazy things, but it's the best example we can think of of a prohibition drug. Methamphetamine would not, this is the judges talking, methamphetamine would not exist but for prohibition because it's cheap, it's easy to make. They said, we're not suggesting that cocaine be legal, but if, these are the judges talking, if cocaine were legal, None of, the, none of these methamphetamine users would be using methamphetamine. They'd be using cocaine without the negative behavioral impact. Now, I will tell you from, from what I know, and government should be engaged in the truth and in information, cocaine literally puts holes in your heart. Now, if you want to make a, a choice to use cocaine, and if you're going to become a regular user of cocaine, the outcome for that is you're going to have a heart attack and die. People my age that have been using cocaine their entire lives aren't alive anymore. They died from a heart attack. Whitney Houston, that's, that's the outcome of a cocaine user. So methamphetamine, cheap, easy to make. The consequences fall disparagingly on the poor. So it's very discriminatory. And then the sentencing goes way up. And it's all because of a drug that is very cheap, very easy to make. And that's why it exists. Right. So it really is a health issue. It's a health issue. It's a prohibition issue. The, the root cause of the problems with drugs, 90% of the problems with drugs, is prohibition related, hmm. not use related. Do you think there's a role for the federal government or the state governments to be creating care for addicts? Well, yes, and the problem, with, the problem with our model today when it comes to treatment is we have a forced treatment model. Do you want to go to prison or do you want to go to treatment? Well, in 100 out of 100 cases, I would like to offer treatment instead of incarceration, but guess what? It doesn't work. It doesn't work, meaning those in treatment will do whatever it takes to get out of treatment, to get declared free from the courts, uh, but they're going to go back to con they're going to go back to what they did before because people want to smoke pot. They don't want to, uh, you know, they don't want to go to jail. Right. Um, so talking about the health issues here with drugs, um, moving on to uh, the health care issue that's before the Supreme Court right now, Obamacare as it is known. The Supreme Court is currently discussing it. It looks like they may quash the Obamacare bill. 
if, if this bill came to you as president, even if it had the support of both houses, what would you have done? Would you have vetoed this bill? I would have vetoed this bill in a heartbeat. It's not affordable. You can't, you can't borrow money to pay for groceries. You can't borrow to pay for health care. Um, what would you do in replace of Obamacare, or do you think government simply has no role? Well, uh, the, the role that government has played is, uh, is a role that has removed health care about as far as it possibly can be from free market. Uh, government could be engaged in a systematic uh, um, approach to eliminating barriers and, and alternatives and uh, health care supply. Um, all sorts of choices and like I say we're about as far removed as we can be from that government restricts access to health care restricts the providers that uh, can that do provide services and that's through uh, licensing and education well we could we could blow the lid off of supply offer all sorts of alternatives and in my opinion a genuine free market approach to health care would be half the health care costs that we currently have and it would not be an insurance model in my, in my estimation if we had genuine free market uh, a genuine free market approach to health care I would not have uh, health insurance to cover myself for ongoing medical need I would have health insurance to cover myself for catastrophic injury and illness and I would pay as you go in a very competitive advertised pricing environment that we sh that we shop in just like we shop for everything else health care is the only item in our lives where we go to the doctor and we have no idea what it's going to cost Mm -hmm. And when we get the bill, we know that nobody is paying that amount of money. Okay. But people on the left would argue that all they're trying to do is bring the cost of health care down under a more free market solution. Um, they don't believe the cost would go down. They believe they would go up. Explain to, to the person that believes this exactly how would health care costs go down under a greater free market model? Well, a, a free market, well, by greater, just a, just a genuine free market approach where, you, where there was advertised pricing, where you knew exactly what it... I think you would have healthcare cl a health care clinic here in Denver that just did x-rays. And if an x-ray today is $275, let me go out on a limb, that the x-ray would be 80 bucks and you would go to a, uh, a radiologist clinic. Uh, you'd know what it is uh, ails you, and they would do that test. And when they did the test, when they did the x-ray, and they told you what was wrong, and they said, hey, you got a sprained uh, shoulder. Uh, give it about six weeks and see how it feels. Well, you come back in six weeks, and you go, you know, it feels just as bad. And the radiologist says, well, you know, we could do an MRI for now this would be my free market so the MRI wouldn't be 4800 bucks anymore it might be 1500 bucks but you can have an MRI for 1500 bucks because maybe it's some sort of uh, shoulder cancer I'm making this up sure. but um, I dare say that I would say you know what I'm gonna give it another six weeks as opposed to getting that uh, MRI but right now it's uh, cover your rear end the liabilities that are associated with back to government and government's involvement there's a huge liability that if you don't do everything that you possibly can well you're gonna be held liable if uh, if things don't turn out right well mm -hmm. you and I should be liable for uh, for our own health and the decisions that we make. When this whole healthcare discussion started with uh, Obama, I had envisioned uh, gallbladders are us. Uh, healthcare clinics that were gonna specialize in gallbladder surgery at thousands of dollars as opposed to tens of thousands of dollars. That it really would have been uh, uh, an airplane ticket somewhere where this gallbladder clinic uh, existed. I use that as an example of what could be uh, heart surgery, uh, cancer treatments, you name it. If we had this kind of competitive environment, uh, we would be dealing with it in uh, much different ways. Mm. Gary, thank you for this time together. Let us end on this final question. All the Ron Paul supporters out there have got a myriad of options when it comes to voting in November. Um, some have talked about voting for Mitt Romney because he's the lesser of two evils and they want to get Obama out of the White House. Others are talking about voting for Obama so that we can have another run of putting a Liberty candidate in the Republican Party in the nomination process in 2016. Others are simply going to not vote at all. Others are going to write in Ron Paul. Others are going to vote for Gary Johnson. So to all of those people, 
per, give us the argument for why they should write your name in or, or vote for you on the ballot since you are on the ballot in every state instead of all of those other options. So, so what I have to request of anybody that's considering voting is just check me out first. Just check me out, GaryJohnson2012.com, and see if I'm not better than Obama when it comes to civil liberties, uh, and if I'm not better than Mitt Romney when it comes to dollars and cents, and this would be based on my resume. I would suggest I crush Obama when it comes to dollars and cents. Uh, I'm going to suggest that I crush Romney when it comes to civil liberties. How about getting the boast, best of both, which isn't too good, by the way, getting, getting the be what, what is supposed to be the best of both, only getting it better. Now, this is, this, is my, this is my argument. This is my sales pitch. And all I can ask is that you just check it out. I am not blowing smoke here. Um, I've been able to do this, and I'll just say, having been governor of New Mexico for eight years, that good government was easy. It wasn't hard. It was easy to look at issues first and politics last. And New Mexico, a state that's two to one Democrat, I get elected twice as a Republican, being a penny pincher, being a, uh, what I believe to be a good steward of tax dollars. Um, I think that resonates with people, and people can also see this notion of uh, it's, government's not for sale. With Gary Johnson, it wasn't for sale. It was about a level playing field for everybody, and I think everybody saw that, and it resonated. Thank you very much. Gary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.